an enormous sun about to sink behind the Dorset Hills. In the foreground, strange spheres inhabit the fields as though they were the sun's satellites. But it's a mirror. A hawk gazes at its own reflection. Another sphere lies at our feet. A mirror, and next to it, a transparent screen. So with the aid of two surfaces, we are looking at a landscape two ways, behind us and in front. And shadows are falling two ways. There are two kinds of sky, red and blue. And another hawk is in flight somewhere above and behind us. The artist was Paul Nash. He called this Landscape from a Dream. And it's no surprise that the year he began it was the year when the first major exhibition of surrealist painting was shown in London, 1936. Dreams, the shock of incongruity. Objects awarded unexpected meaning through surprise associations. Such things were the grammar of surrealism, especially for the painter Nash was most taken with, the Belgian René Magritte. There are several Magritte-like touches here. The mirror itself, and the games that can be played with it. The fact that the hawk is reflected in the mirror, but the framework of the screen is not. Realistic clouds are placed next to artificial ones. And how big is the mirror? In relation to the hawk, you might think it fairly small. How big is a hawk? But the mirror casts a shadow as far as the distant hills. The surrealism of Paul Nash never submerges a love of real landscape. This is very clearly the Dorset coast, where the hills come down to form promontories between rocky bays, and the sea is silver under heavy cumulus clouds. It's evening. The sunset tells us that. The sun, huge on the horizon. Shadows are long. The grass is golden in late summer. And the spheres? They're actually round bales of hay or corn. Nash had seen them in a film on the American prairies and imported them into his picture. The hawks imported, too, from an ancient Egyptian carving. I turn to landscape, Nash wrote, not for the landscape's sake, but for the things behind. The roots of his art lay in a romantic and very English view of landscape that you find in the paintings of Samuel Palmer, in the poetry of Wordsworth, and the novels of Thomas Hardy. A landscape is full of presence of symbolic meanings, powers we don't understand, powers over us. Through strange correspondences between natural and man-made images, Nash sought to pinpoint the emotional intensity we sometimes feel in the landscape about us. Nash took a photograph of the motif and how banal it looks. But Nash saw it differently. He cut out the buildings, he raised the trees in line, made it twilight, always good for magic, and added a moon to converse, so to speak, with the classical pillar. With Nash, images always mean more than they literally represent, though it's not always clear what they mean. In an early drawing in the Tate Gallery, Nash set the pyramids half engulfed by giant waves under a partial eclipse of the moon. The moon's power over the tides threatens some of the oldest and most permanent constructions of man. Five years later, 1917, a cherry orchard in Gloucestershire is bare of leaves and life and protected by barbed wire so that it becomes an echo of the landscape of the trenches where Nash had been fighting as an infantryman.
In the 20s and early 30s, his work took a new turn. That love of mysterious presences steered him towards the art of the Italian painter De Chirico, whose work was shown in London in 1928, the year before Nash painted this picture, Blue House on the Shore. The most ordinary of buildings is given a touch of the sinister by an emphatic shadow and the dead black interior. In the same year, one of his most arresting landscapes. It's a view from the rear of the cottage in Sussex where the artist now lived. Again, objects are awarded an eerie life of their own. A simple basket called a Sussex truck. Just a post and a wicker fence. A pile of logs with an orchard beyond. All of them made to look artificial by the accompaniment of this tall screen, which doesn't seem to belong at all. A few years later, mid-30s, and it's the mystery of reflections that begins to catch his imagination. A hotel dining room which had mirrors on facing walls and globe lights from the ceiling becomes a dream labyrinth called Voyages of the Moon. Very soon, events were to land a new subject virtually on Nash's doorstep. When the Second World War broke out, he moved to Oxford. And there, outside the city, he went to photograph a dump of German aircraft shot down during the Battle of Britain. These torn and twisted shapes were ready-made for Nash's imagination. Neither de Chirico nor Magritte ever had images quite like these to play with. And Nash responded with the painting he entitled Totus Mir, Dead Sea. Along with Henry Moore's shelter drawings, this is the most memorable British work of art to come out of the Second World War. A graveyard of German aircraft under the eye of the moon. Those favorite twilight colors of Nash and that pervading sense of mystery. The thing looked to me suddenly like a great inundating sea, he wrote. You might feel this is a vast tide moving across the fields, the breakers rearing up and crashing on the plain. The only living creature is another favorite image a bird in flight, an owl hunting for mice. They haunt the mind, these recurring images. Birds, clouds, sun and moon, seas, mirrors, screens, shadows, ambiguous forms. So many elements in his other paintings come together in landscape from a dream. And like images in a dream, they ask to be interpreted and in the interpretation lose what makes them memorable. As in the best of Nash, here is the natural landscape as a setting for the unnatural. Nash walking a cliff edge between perception and introspection. 